This month on 219 West, a neighborhoods fight to keep their land and get basic services. As far as the government goes to take my property at this point in time away from me and discard me like an old shoe, I, I, I think it's very wrong of them. We'll talk to New York State Senator Tony Avella about the fight to save Willits Point. A new program called City Bike Share could make bikes more accessible, but will the streets be more dangerous? And we'll explore the age-old question, can you really pursue happiness? We definitely live in a society that, where there's, there's pressure to, to not only be happy, but to show that you're happy. And welcome to 219 West. I'm Matilda Mel. And I'm Jonathan Moffey. The fight to overhaul Willits Point, the gritty industrial neighborhood just beyond the outfield wall of City Field, has been raging for more than 50 years. The Bloomberg administration has heated up the land war. The mayor's development plan promises economic development in Queens, but signals the end of an era for the businesses and residents of the area. 219 West reporter Candace Shepard takes us there. Joseph Artizone is the only resident living in the 62-acre industrial park known as Willits Point. He lives in a modest two-story brick house and rents out the first floor as a local deli. He has lived here his whole life, but the 80-year-old may have to give up the only home he knows once the city starts to redevelop the neighborhood. Uh, right now, um, I'm really not in a position to do anything. And as far as the government goes, to take my property at this point in time, away from me and discard me like an old shoe. I, I, I think it's very wrong of them. The plan's goal for economic development includes creating more than 7,000 new jobs and building hotels, retail shops, and housing units. But when the city council approved Mayor Michael Bloomberg's plan in 2008, it also approved the potential use of eminent domain, the taking of private property by the government for public use. Michael Rikon, an eminent domain attorney representing a group of Willits Point business and property owners called Willits Point United, says that it's almost impossible to stop eminent domain in New York. And it is so easy to go forward and condemn property in New York. At this point, I think it's probably 46 states, or if not more, have adopted limitation on condemning for uh, economic development. Not New York, and I don't think New York will ever uh, do it because of the political ramifications of real estate and politics. Real estate drives politics in New York State, and they'll never restrict it. The city backed out of its eminent domain claim in 2012 after Willits Point United filed a lawsuit against the city, but it moved forward with a revised multi-phase plan proposed by two developers, related companies, and Sterling Equities, the real estate firm of Fred Wilpon and Saul Katz, owners of the New York Mets. We put it on papers the last time that this was just a pretext to uh, afford uh, the um, the New York Mets owners with additional parking and clear off some unsightly businesses. And, and that's what it appears <laughs> that it was all along. Property owner Irene Prestigiacomo says that while the city is making deals with private developers to take over property, it has yet to improve the poor living conditions of the area, like the lack of a sewer system and unpaved streets. I pay taxes, you know, have to pay the taxes, which have doubled for no services. These are taxes paid for services that we do not get here. I mean, and it's, it's infuriating. And we even tried to fight that at one point as a group. And the judge at the time said, well, it's point people, you're just uh, making a big stink because you don't want your property taken. What kind of an answer is that? Irene has attempted several times to renovate her property on her own, which she rents out to seven tenants who run auto repair shops. She could not get permits from the city to make repairs. If they would just put the infrastructure in or let us do it, because we can do it, put the infrastructure in, the rest will come and it would build itself up. This place would grow and prosper and it would be just wonderful because you couldn't stop it after that. 
and that's why they don't want us to have them. Building up the infrastructure of Willits Point is a major part of the plan. The city's economic development corporation that oversees the project states on its website that the area has limited stormwater and sanitary systems, things the city never put in place. We never, ever, and ever since my father was here, he tried to get sanitary sewers. Denied us those. It is a situation of uh, designed neglect. Because the city must have blight, they have permanently blighted that area and kept it blighted. There's no sewer, there's no storm sewers, and there's no sanitation, and there's no roads. It's just outrageous. Escaping the conditions of Willits Point isn't as easy as moving your business to another part of town. Relocation assistance has been offered to businesses during the first phase of the project. But Ralph St. John of St. John Enterprises, a general contractor at Willits Point, says that there is no place in the city that he knows of that could hold his trailers, bulldozers, and dump trucks. That's just a lot of blah, blah. That's really not the intent in my evaluation. They tell you those things, but first of all, there's nowhere to go in regards to the style of property we have and what we can do with it. The Economic Development Corporation declined to speak on camera or over the phone about its relocation plan, but provided an official statement. The city is providing relocation assistance through Cornerstone Group, a business relocation expert. Cornerstone commenced its current rounds of business relocation outreach in August 2012 and has spoken with businesses on city-owned property in Phase 1 at least twice, and in many cases, numerous times, to help understand their needs and present possible relocation sites. There's no real relocation assistance. In my experience, throughout all condemnation proceedings, the, the condemning authority comes up with a relocation specialist, but actually very few people are relocated with the assistance of these experts. It's more or less something that they can show to a judge in court when they go to a victim. The city is moving ahead with plans to review a formal request from project developers to obtain special parking and zoning permits at Willits Point. This is the latest step in transforming what developers see as an eyesore into a more vibrant neighborhood for the public. But Artizone doesn't see it that way. I think it's the, all the laws that they have in place is only to benefit the rich people. I think they better stop this way of thinking. I think they better start thinking about how the people can function and better produce. Artizone says he won't get tired of fighting the city. Come next year, a new Queensboro president and mayor could radically turn things around for the neighborhood, including an end to the project. For 219 West, this is Candace Shepard in Willits Point. Willits Point is just one of several major development projects proposed by the Bloomberg administration. That area in Queens is represented in Albany by State Senator Tony Avella, who is also running for Queensboro president. Senator Avella, Welcome to 219 West. Well, thanks for having me on your show. Senator Vela, so uh, why did you vote against the Willits Point Development Project in 2008 as a city councilman? Well, first of all, it's a misuse of eminent domain. That's what the city has been threatening these business owners for years. Eminent domain should only be used in very isolated situations where we're taking somebody's private business, private home for a real public purpose, a park, a highway, a school, or a hospital. But to take away these businesses um, and then give it to a private developer who's going to make maybe $100, $200 million on the project, I think is very un-American. And supposedly, it, the whole idea behind it is to create jobs. Well, there were 3,000 jobs there now. So you're going to close down these businesses, put 3,000 people out of work to bring in some other jobs. It just didn't make sense to me. And uh, I used to work for Mayor Koch and Mayor Dinkins. And going back 30 years now, if the city had just put in the infrastructure, which it hasn't done for 50 years in that area, development would have taken care of itself. And, and now, actually, the city's doing that. So why not let the develop, why not put in the infrastructure, and then development will take care of itself because the businesses, the property will become so valuable that the businesses will either expand or they'll sell out to other businesses. So if you're elected Queensborough president, uh, how could you help facilitate this effort to kind of... Well, the, the Queensborough president has an advisory role in land use issues. And obviously, whoever the mayor is looks to the borough president for these type of projects for support. Um, I'd like to see a better plan 
put together, not only for Willits Point, but for the entire borough. We don't do planning. What we do is we do knee-jerk reactions to developers. There's no question in my mind that the whole Willits Point project was initiated by developers, not by the city, but by some interested developers in related properties is always the one that comes up. They've done the most projects under the Bloomberg administration. Um, that goes to the city and say, hey, listen, give us permission to develop this area and we'll do it. But that's not proper planning. The city should be looking at Here's areas where we need to preserve, uh, where there's a residential character that needs to be protected. But here's areas where we need commercial development, where we need affordable housing. And it should be community-based planning. And, and that's what I'd like to initiate is, is the, if I'm elected by the residents of Queens to be the next borough president. Now, is there a particular mayoral candidate that you think would uh, champion Willits Point and uh Someone you, that kind of falls in line with your views that well, you would... Yeah, so far I haven't made a decision on who I'm supporting. I want to see somebody who really wants to turn the system around. Instead of from the top down, it's from the bottom up. My favorite expression has always been, nobody knows their block better than the people who live there. And it's about time we started listening to people and really have community-based planning. I haven't seen that uh, position... Um, uh, talked about by any of the mayoral candidates yet. And I'm the only one talking about it as the borough president candidate. Okay, and um, so uh, with you know the opening day just happening this week, uh, what, did, what would you say to people that kind of think that uh, you know around City Field you may want this development uh, when you go to the game? It's kind of like what do we do before the game? What do we do after uh, the Mets game? And that's a very good argument, but it goes back to what I you know previously mentioned that why not just put in the infrastructure and then the the business owners there who've been doing the city's job of putting in their own dry wells the, you know their own sewers um, give them the opportunity to make a profit and improve the area that's the american way i mean some of these businesses are family owned they've been there for generations and it's very interesting when i first get involved helping these businesses fight against the city's proposal um, i came across a business owner who had been kicked out of College Point when the city wanted to develop the College Point Corporate Park 35 years ago. They told them, go to Willits Point. And now Willits Point, the city is telling them, we're going to kick you out of there. And meanwhile, it's only now that the College Point Corporate Park is being developed by the city 35 years later. So sometimes what the city does absolutely doesn't make sense. And Who's the biggest employer in terms of jobs in the city and the state of New York? Small businesses. So why aren't we helping them instead of kicking them out so that we can have a large developer put in some sort of mega complex? Doesn't make sense. Senator Vela, thanks again for joining us. No, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Mathilde, back to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Another Bloomberg initiative has been to encourage people to use bicycles to get around the city. A new program starting next month is designed to help that effort. But with more bikes come more questions about safety. Imagine being able to pick up a bike easier than hailing a taxi. A new program called City Bike Share is designed to do just that. Paul Steely White, Executive Director of Transportation Alternatives, welcomes this new transit option. Well, you know, City Bike is, I think, the most uh, logical evolution of New York becoming, uh, you know, more livable metropolis, um, a place where people have myriad transportation choices. The City Bike Share program will begin in May. When it is fully rolled out, the cyclists will have access to thousands of bikes at hundreds of stations in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. The program is meant for cyclists taking short trips under three miles. The cost varies from almost $10 for a day, $25 for a week, to $95 for an annual membership. One of Bloomberg's biggest initiatives has been the development of a bike-friendly policy. For instance, bike lanes. The mayor claimed that this initiative has been good for the environment and has another benefit. In addition to expanding our transit network and creating jobs, City Bike will also help us achieve a third goal and that is making our streets safer. Our Department of Transportation, led by Commissioner Jeanette Setekan, has helped us bring traffic fatalities down 40% since 2001 to the lowest levels on record. And we started keeping records something like in 1916. Not everyone shared the mayor's enthusiasm for bike lanes. There were protests and lawsuits. And even before it began, the City Bike Share program is already running into criticism. Sometimes I have really 
disturbing close calls with bicyclists. I, I've been in the village when I was crossing with the light and a bicyclist just came whizzing right in front of me. Jean Ryan, a former teacher, uses a wheelchair because of illness. She fears that more bikes might mean more danger. Ryan fears she will be hit by a bicycle because she hasn't seen enough effort so people know what the rules are. This has been one of the biggest complaints, is the lack of enforcement of bikes safe, safely using the streets or the, and not using the sidewalks in all the boroughs. Even though safety is a concern, similar programs have been successful in other major cities around the world. Paris in 2007, Hangzhou in 2008, and London in 2010. I think uh, what New York um, has actually lacked compared to some other world-class cities is really safe bicycling and uh, safe and accessible bicycling. Looking at some of New York's you know, competitors, whether it's San Francisco, uh, or you know London or Paris or you know cities like Copenhagen, you know they've been developing you know bike networks and you know alternative uh, transportation options for a long time, and so uh, I think now New York um, unfortunately is not on the cutting edge when it comes to bike sharing. Hilda Cohen, mother of two bikes daily, she tried city bike last summer during a tryout period, and hopes that it will change people's way of thinking. I don't think that these are speed racer bikes. I've actually tried one and they're quite heavy. I mean, you can't go that fast. And as soon as someone gets on a bike and sees how easy it is, but how very little respect you get from some pedestrians and some motorists, um, I think there's going to be sort of this change of heart of like, oh, oh, that's why. Oh, this makes so much sense now. In the meantime, City Bike Share might be an occasion for New Yorkers to rediscover their city. The City Bike Share is going to allow people to experience the city in a whole new way. They're going to have lived here all their life and they're never going to have seen some of the streets that they'll be able to see. Later on 219 West, looking for happiness on the streets of New York. I am going to burst one day of happiness. You will see me burst on the street because I'm so freaking happy. I just love life. My name's Reggie. Just recently, my wife and I took in her sister's children. We already had four, so I went from becoming a family man to a man with a bigger family. <clears throat> now you can't eat love, so I don't know how I'm gonna feed them tonight. How was that, Reggie? I think I look more like Denzel. That's cold, man. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. How you doing? My name's Steve. My family's lived in this neighborhood for years. Recently, things got so tight, we had to go to our local food bank for help. I lost a lot of sleep worrying about what the neighbors might think. That is until I saw them there, too. How'd I do, Steve? A little stiff. If you could have done a little what? better. What? Come on. You know, I have an Academy Award. Yeah, but not for playing me. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. You realize that 49 million Americans struggle with hunger? That's one out of every six Americans. These people are around us every day. They're our friends, they're our coworkers, their kids go to school with our kids. Sometimes we're not even aware that they're struggling. This problem is closer than you think. But so is the solution. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Next, an artist who is struggling to continue his work despite a life-changing illness by mastering a technique called light painting. Anya Pinello brings us this story from Roosevelt Island. We kind of like recycle the world through our minds and bring them out in the dark with the, with the flashlights. Steve Era doesn't take regular photographs. I found that taking pictures the traditional way was not a way that I ever made anything interesting or good. It may look a little strange, but the results are surprising. And what's more surprising is that Steve Era is legally blind. 
Imagine looking at the world through a very, very small straw. And only the only, just close your eyes and look through a tiny little straw. And psh, bicyclists and psh, psh, and people running around and the baby carriage is being pushed, you know, right on the end. That's how you have to navigate the world with retinitis pigmentosa. It's um, it's very difficult. Growing up, Steve knew he had eye problems, but it wasn't until he was about to graduate from Parsons School of Design that he was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa a degenerative eye disease that will eventually leave Steve totally blind. If you're a visual artist, your world is, is wrapped up in, in your sense of sight. But rather than giving up on art, Steve is adapting. Once a painter, Steve moved on to photography when his eyesight became too weak to paint. The photographs look like paintings, and when I saw this technique, I was just like, blown away because you don't have to see. The technique is called light painting, and it uses flashlights and laser beams to highlight objects in total darkness. Steve first learned the technique from photography teacher and friend Mark Andres. People can work on a very equal level in terms of doing the light painting because it's not about seeing. It's you're making the pictures with your body and with your mind, and a sighted person can't see what the picture is going to look like when they're making it, unlike most photographs. When you're doing a light painting, you have no idea what it's going to look like when it's done. You have to create that in your head, so it's a very different kind of process. But Steve knows that one day his eyesight will be too poor to photograph, so he's learning to adapt again and is transcribing old journals for his next endeavor, writing. That's not it, period. Later, comma. I don't know. I'm turning more towards writing now um, because I have to write. I, I, I have to like, I have to abandon the visual world in a, in a way, you know. Um, I have to uh, have it pried from my fingers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I want to hold on to it. So um, I, wanna, um, I want to be able to develop my writing skills so I can um, have something uh, in the future when I, when I can't see. An artist through and through. For 219 West, I'm Anya Pinello in Roosevelt Island. My name is Fernanda. I'm the wife of a teacher. Budget cuts affected my husband's salary, so I'm picking up some part-time work. We're doing everything we can to make sure our kids eat today. Tomorrow, I just don't know. Fernanda, how'd I do? Well, I usually fold the underwear first. I meant the acting, but Good to know. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Do your part. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank today. Do your part. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank today. Can you go and seize happiness? Or must you wait for happiness to find you? That's a question for people everywhere. But here, in typical New York fashion, it's pursued with a dogged intensity. Natalia Osipova has the story. Happiness isn't a spectator sport. It's not something you can just sit at like wait to come to you, you create it. To make herself happy, New Yorker Michelle Johnny Lapidus organized a skipping club. It meets in Manhattan Parks every Thursday. It's just literally something that can, can elevate the mood and create like a new environment on the streets that's normally just people walking by. And that's what I love most about it, is how it just changes the environment. Many New Yorkers think there is a lot to change, and they're pursuing all sorts of techniques to find happiness. But that pursuit can lead to complications, say some scholars who study happiness. A recent study suggests that people who claim that happiness is very important to them score as less happy than people who say it's not so important. And the logic is simple. If you're so preoccupied with trying to be happy, you may constantly be aware of the fact that you're not as happy as you could ultimately be, and that leads to frustration. Professor Prince notes that the challenges are especially difficult for people in high-stress environments, like New York City. Life in New York is full of struggle. People have to hustle to make a living. They're in competition with the most talented, most educated, most beautiful, wealthiest people in the world. 
people have a day-to-day -day living that mostly consists of, of work and when they leave the office at the end of the day, they're often feeling downtrodden and finding ways to make their lives better through the recreational activities becomes more important than it would be in other places. Ads in Subway promise sustainable happiness from the School of Practical Philosophy. A fee for the 10-week course is $90. We definitely live in a society that, where there's, there's pressure to, to not only be happy, but to show that you're happy. There's also the mentality like, fake it till you make it. In Buddhism, we speak of that as a kind of a dream. It's the dream that if I just do this, everything will work out. Jeffrey Shugan Arnold is a sensei at Fire Lotus Temple in Brooklyn. At different points in our lives, we feel betrayed because we're doing all the right things. We're doing what we're supposed to do. And yet we're not experiencing the life that we have, rightfully have a sense we, we want to feel. Arnold explains that the Buddhist way to find happiness is to stop looking for it. In fact, what we need to do is let go of all of our ideas about happiness and just begin to relieve and let go of what causes us to be unhappy. As those things begin to fall away, naturally what will arise is happiness. That is very different from the approach employed in American culture. The pursuit of happiness is a right stated in the Declaration of Independence, as important as the right to life and liberty. Yet the document doesn't define what happiness is. I want to know what happiness is, and philosophers have really divided whether happiness is pleasure or happiness is life satisfaction. In the sense that by your own values your life is going well, that gets at something that everybody in every culture can care about. And every individual can use their own values to decide whether their life is good. In our culture, we're very often frightened by emotions, particularly strong emotions. And because of that fear, we tend to just reject them. So normally we, we seek out those things that will bring us happiness. And we try and avoid those things that are difficult. But the Buddha said, even for a fully enlightened being, life includes adversity. Whether happiness is a lifetime commitment, a duty, or just a mirage, a recipe for it is always personal from the academic perspective. What the science tells us is that different things make different people happy. Fortunately, I think there's no formula for happiness. And it's unfortunate if you're a business person trying to promise that you can make anybody happy. And if you encounter anybody who makes such a promise, they're selling you snake oil. And I think that anybody interested in trying to improve happiness has to have a personal, individual approach. Happiness is uh, feeling fulfilled and uh, creative, spreading love and community. Happiness is sharing, sociability, and creativity. And enjoying life. <laughs> To me, happiness is enjoying the moment. It's enjoying your company with yourself. It's creating experiences for yourself. I think doses of sadness are natural and okay. Being comfortable with just being sad must be really sad. I am going to burst one day of happiness. You will see me burst on the street because I'm so freaking happy. I just love life. We're changing the skip. For 219 West, I'm Natalia Osipova. That's all for this edition of 219 West. I'm Jonathan Moffey. And I'm Matilda Mill. We'll be back next month with more stories from the five boroughs and beyond.